like to start by reviewing a little bit. Of, hello, good evening. I'd like to start by reviewing a little bit of what we talked about in the last lecture. We we're talking about the early classical period, and we're setting up for what the early classical composers were going after in terms of aesthetics. We're looking for the things they found beautiful. And this was a time in which music tended to sound rather superficial. Superficial meaning outwardly beauty and immediate effects of feelings. But these feelings which are stylized, stylized meaning that it's not necessarily deep within its meaning, it's rather, I'm sad, I'm happy sort of something that is acted out. Um, this was also the time of aristocrats. Do, does everyone understand the word aristocrat here? Yeah, it means the nobleman, the, the status of nobleman in Europe. And they, especially in what is now Austria and the neighboring countries back then called Austrian Empire, people particularly cared a lot about music. They found music to be the best kind of entertainment that were sort of in comp competition within, with one another as to who had the biggest orchestras and biggest musicians to show off their prowess to a point where sometimes the, the prince or count would go bankrupt because they wanted to spend money to show off and then re realize that they really screwed up their finances. Um, so that's where we find ourselves in. Now the late classical period, which I've uh, sort of, I sort of surmise to be between 1790s and 17, uh, 1820s, it's time of turmoil. You might notice three things that I wrote right underneath classical period. Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars. Um, is everyone familiar with the concept of enlightenment? I mean, I'm not expecting the, the little people here to understand what that is yet, but can somebody explain to me what enlightenment is? Good evening. Oh, that's the audience asking. Yeah, what a way to enter <laughs> with a big <laughs> question. What is the no Yes, either of you. So religion was very powerful in its grip, you know, so much so that the, the demarcation of Protestant church and the Catholic church were very clearly felt culturally, as well as, well as uh, and, and the border still stays. Um, and this was starting to break down. And with that became the notion of, well, I mean, kings have been saying, we have the God-given power over these people. We have the right, as the divine di dictated us, to rule over these people. But now that people are less inclined to believe this, there was a notion that, well, princes and counts and kings, what are they good for? Are they really necessary? Scientifically speaking, they also eat. They also have to go to the bathroom. They're still humans. Why do we have to listen to them? And this resulted in some catastrophic events in Europe. In France, there was the French Revolution. Starting from 1789, the French people revolted, demanding that their miserable lives be corrected. And King Louis XVI, of course, tried, but not hard enough because he was enjoying his vanities too much to simplify. And that resulted in eventually people really revolting and overthrowing the, the, ki the king and the queen, which resulted in their execution. And with that uh, ensued a whole bunch of more executions of wiping out whoever was either part of the aristocracy or part or accused of being an aristocrat. Um, this was 
a huge deal and for the neighboring countries a very scary thing you know let's not forget that Marie Antoinette the Queen of France was the sister of Joseph II Emperor of Austria and there was a great deal even though Emperor Joseph II was a man of enlightenment in fact he was a member of the Freemasonry and he, he, he advocated for science even though he also assumed to be the head of the Catholic Church in the Austrian Empire which is very confusing um, he didn't like the fact that his sister was executed and didn't want the same thing to happen to him so there was a great deal of controlling of society a great deal of tightening uh, of, of weeding out any rebellion Uh, springing forth, we, we see the dates 1803 to 1815. I can't really go into the details of the French Revolution because this is obviously a one year course of its own. Um, so eventually, after much, much blood, the French settled on this general by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, who gained such popularity. And eventually, it leads to him crowning himself the emperor. Of France which is ironic of course because that's exactly what the French people didn't want but in the end it became an empire and with empire had, had empirical uh, ambitions which was that Napoleon conquered entire Europe and for a while he was quite successful um, Austrian Empire for example was annexed by the French um, they really advanced all the way up to Russia, but always with Russia, invading Russia is a whole task that shouldn't be taken lightly, which Napoleon did, and that resulted in much defeat, which eventually brought forth Napoleon's demise, and that ended the Napoleonic War. So as you can see, there's a great deal of confusion in the society. I mean, for for about 20 years or so, the whole 20, 30 years, the entire continent is in turmoil. And this is where we find our main subject of the day, Ludwig van Beethoven. Um, Beethoven was, of course, by the way, is, is there anyone in this room that hasn't heard of the name Beethoven before? Just to make sure. Okay, good. Beethoven, of course, is the most influential composer in the Western European world. Um, his presence has left such such a print that still to this day, I don't think a composer could possibly have the guts to say that I have no influence from Beethoven. Beethoven has left such an imprint. Um, he had a very humble upbringing. I'm going to tell you a little bit about his life. <clears throat> his grandfather was a singer in the court of Bonn, which is near the Netherlands. And he, he supposed to have a very nice bass sound. And his father, Beethoven's father, was also a singer, a tenor, and he could play the piano and the violin well enough to give lessons. Um, there are many legends surrounding Beethoven. Often it's the case when you have a popular person, right? And it's very hard to tell whether it's legends are based on facts or not. But you might have heard that Beethoven's father was abusive and that the mother was angelic. This is not proven. There is no really a real account of Beethoven standing up at the piano crying as he's getting beaten by his father. This is perhaps a made-up story, but Beethoven's musical talent was appreciated from a young age. And Beethoven was given much musical education from a young age as a result. Eventually, he's in the hands of a man named Neffe, who introduced Beethoven to the entire set of the well-tempered clavier by Bach, which wasn't so readily available at the time. But the fact that Beethoven was educated in this meant that he had a great talent. And at the age of eight or nine, at that, you know, I, I can't dare assign 
a prelude and fugue by Bach at age eight or nine. So you can see that Beethoven was really quite musically mature already. Um, let's get back to geography. So Europe, if Europe is like this, there's Italy, which looks like a boot. Austria is over here. And Bonn is near the Netherlands, way out here. This is a far distance. I think it's something like seven to nine days of horse ride. So it's not a close distance to travel. And it was a provincial town, this Bonn. So you would assume any musician being born in a provincial town would end up being provincial and be forgotten. But Beethoven was very, very lucky because Bonn was the capital of the electorate of Cologne, a region controlled by the Austrian Empire. And the elector of Bonn was the brother of the Emperor of Austria, which meant that it was one of the most powerful places to be. So even though geographically he was very far away from city of music at the time, he had a direct connection to the city. Many aristocrats from Vienna traveled to Bonn to, in a way to give lip service and to make sure that they were in good standing with the brother of the emperor so that they would be well over in Vienna. Um, and it was also helpful that the brother of the emperor loved music and had his own orchestra. And Beethoven was part of that as a young boy. He was paid salary from as early as age 11, which was really helpful. Um, Beethoven's talent was immediately recognized by the elector himself, and he paid for him to travel to Vienna. Uh, <clears throat> I think he was 14 or 15 at the time. If I get that right. Yes, he was in his late teens. And we don't know whether he met Mozart during that time, but the intention was clear, which was that Beethoven studied with Mozart. Um, we know for sure that Beethoven at least attended a concert by Mozart because Beethoven writes in his letter, quote, Mozart cannot play legato, which is very interesting. A young teenager commenting on the 35 year old Mozart can't play legato. Um, Beethoven had to return immediately though. I think he only stayed two weeks, which is sad because he spent 10 days traveling all day to Vienna, only to return oh, two weeks later because his mother was dying and she ended up dying. And with that, he, had, he was now in, in, in a position to take care of his alcoholic father and two younger brothers. And he stayed in Bonn for a long time uh, until his father passed away in which case he left his brothers in boarding school and moved back to Vienna. And this was only possible because he had befriended as member of the orchestra in Bonn, many aristocrats from Vienna. This is another interesting story too, is that the great genius that we celebrate today would not be known if it weren't for the fact that he had this help from other people. I wrote a whole bunch of names here. The bottom list are four of many admiring aristocrats that Beethoven benefited from. The man that really brought Beethoven to Vienna was a man named Count Wallstein. Later, Beethoven writes a sonata nicknamed Wallstein to him in gratitude and many things. Um, he paid for Beethoven to travel. He got, got the Elector of Bonn to pay for Beethoven's stay for a year. Um, and with the distinct goal of studying with Haydn, who by this point was in his 60s and yet still writing a lot of music and was now enjoying an international success. Um, the, the mentorship from Haydn wasn't a very peaceful one though because Haydn was a little lazy I think it's, that's the best way to put it. Haydn was paid handsome money from the Elector of Bonn and uh, he enjoyed the money, but he didn't really enjoy teaching. So he was lazy. He only taught him 
basic theory, uh, and there's no indication of Haydn teaching him any free composition at all. And after a year, Haydn took off to London for his big success concert series. And he wasn't gonna come back for another year and a half. So Beethoven was very disappointed and went and studied with other people. So you have here a list of people. So we mentioned about Neffer already, yeah? Um, list of people that he did study with. August Berger was one man recommended by Haydn and who really thor thoroughly te taught him. And then another name, Antonio Salieri, who I don't know, does that name sound familiar to you at all? Has anybody watched the movie Amadeus, which was from the 80s? Yes. Salieri was perhaps really wrongfully depicted in that movie as a jealous counterpart to Mozart. Although in real life, Salieri nothing, had nothing to be jealous of as he was the court composer of the emperor. And he was perhaps financially the most successful musician in Vienna, which meant in the entire music world of Europe. Um, so young 20 something year old Beethoven is now enjoying rising successes in small concerts uh, put together by aristocrats, mm -hmm. since he had such good connections with the aristocrats back in Bonn, he continued to make more connections. Um, a man named Prince Lichnowsky was another man who, who, who uh, took Beethoven under his wing, in fact, lived in his palace uh, in Vienna, and Beethoven wrote music for him. In fact, his very first publication is dedicated to Lichnowsky in gratitude. Um, and things seem to go pretty well, except somewhere around 1802, this is now Beethoven in his early 30s, he notices that his hearing is going. We, everybody knows that Beethoven went deaf, of course. This is something that is taught the moment Beethoven's name is mentioned. Um, and Beethoven really mourns this because he is a very competitive fellow. And he thinks, I can't tell people that I'm going deaf because then what would they think of me as a musician? All my enemies will think of me, you know, in such a way, such a despicable way, and I don't want to be embarrassed. So over the next few years, he withdraws himself more and more away from the crowd. Um, I think in 1804, I might be getting that date wrong, he writes this very dramatic letter called the Heiligenstadt Testament. Heiligenstadt is a suburb of Vienna where there's a very famous hot spring, bless you, hot spring, and he was trying to cure his illnesses there of no avail. I mean, taking hot bath isn't gonna help your deafness. Um, where he writes a long letter to his brothers talking about this illness and how he has plagued them and how embarrassed he is. And then for a while he contemplated dying, committing suicide, but that he has now overcome this thought and he's going to die whenever God calls him. But until then he will try in his best to fulfill what has been given to him, which is this gift of music. Um, and from that point on, his music turns. You see, up to this point is what we call his early period, which was sort of the continuation of the tradition of Mozart and Haydn, this lighthearted classical aesthetics. For, from 1802, as he's becoming more withdrawn, and as he's struggling more with his health. And not to forget that he's also struggle, struggling romantically. Uh, he's finding himself more and more lonely and being rejected by those he, love, he loves. Um, he is starting to have a new rhetoric in style, which is this rhetoric of heroism. This feeling of struggle followed by victory. And this is found again and then again and again in most of his sonatas written between 1802, roughly speaking, leading up to about 1815. Everybody knows the Fifth Symphony, yes? It's the... This is a classic example of the middle period. The first movement being... By the last movement, the music has changed key into C major. Right. 
minutes of absolute frenzy of joy. Um, and this was rather unusual for the classically uh, uh, um, exposed people, right? The music was supposed to be lighthearted and entertaining. And then here it was very dramatic and, and almost difficult to hear, very personal. And so it's worthy of note, by the way, I'm withdrawing myself here for a second, that even though we celebrate Beethoven so publicly, in his lifetime up to this point, Beethoven isn't really a public figure. That's another thing to, to that I think we, it's worthy of mentioning. Oh, you know, as it is the case with most classical music, this is music for the few. Beethoven is generally writing music for the aristocrats who are well-versed in music, who love music, who love to pour money for music, who themselves played instruments, who themselves would have become professional musicians if it weren't for the curse that they were born into aristocracy. They were forced into keep appearances. So having Beethoven was like fulfilling their unfulfilled dream of becoming a musician. Razmovsky, for example, who was a Russian diplomat uh, deployed in, in, in Austrian Empire, was a very accomplished violinist. And he, in his palace, uh, had three other musicians always available, one violinist, one violist, and a cellist, so that he could play string quartets together every day. And this is why we have now Beethoven's Razmovsky string quartets, some of which have Russian folk tunes quoted so that Prince Razmovsky will think of his homeland and think fondly of the music, so on and so forth. Um, so the music was written specifically for a highly musically educated upper echelon. And these symphonies were also the same case. They were written really for those small group of people. I can't emphasize it enough. Anybody who tells you otherwise isn't really telling you the full story. Um, I believe in his life, Beethoven only had a handful of public concerts that he gave. The notion of public concerts for general public wasn't really around yet. Concerts were really for those who could pay for it. Um, now, starting from 1815 though, people are really feeling the the brunt of the chaos that Napoleon had caused. First of all, many of the aristocrats that did pay for Beethoven's life either died or went bankrupt because Napoleon had destroyed their country um, and was no longer willing to pay for Beethoven's day-to-day -day expenses. And even though Beethoven was making a lot of money with his publications, which Beethoven was very keen on doing, first musician to pub publish his music very actively, to a point where he had six and seven publishers fighting against each other to try to get the best rate from Beethoven. Um, Beethoven needed some sort of security. And this was the brief point in his life between 1814 to 1816, where he does try to write music meant for public. This was time he wrote his opera Fidelio, the only opera. This was time that he wrote, perhaps not so not so great work by him, I must admit, called the Welling Wellington's Victory, written to celebrate the victory of General Wellington against Napoleon. Really a half piece, if I must tell you, but it was incredibly popular. Um, Ruins of Athens, another piece for the theater. So about this four years period was when general public knew of Beethoven. And this is, these were the music pieces that we actually I mean, how many of you do know this tune by Beethoven? This is part of Ruins of Athens, and of course this tune is very popular because it was meant for popular music. Um, but as always, the taste, musical taste of Vienna was fickle. And by 1817, nobody cared for Beethoven's style of music. This was now time for operas by Bellini and of Rossini. And Beethoven was considered weird and old fashioned and it was never really in the scene anyway. Um, and Beethoven by this point did enjoy quite a bit of financial success. Um, so he withdraws from 
writing music for anybody, really. And that's the beginning of the late period. Late period is a very sad time for Beethoven because first of all, he had his really bad health. He was very ill throughout these last 10 years of his life. And he was stone deaf, that also doesn't help. He, on top of all of that, he, feeling that he was bereft of any family life, decides to cling on to the nephew of his dead brother. Um, his name was Carl. Um, by snatching him away from his mother and fighting years and years of bitter court battles to try to take custody of his nephew, which eventually ended up in the nephew trying to kill himself. Um, all of this was incredibly tragic and upsetting, and so his composition diminishes in size. But the things that he does write, he writes for himself now. The public doesn't really care for it. The aristocrats that cared for him are basically gone. So he's really writing music for himself. And the music that you hear is very reflective. It's somewhat ill, it's somewhat complicated, hard to understand, but overall gives a feeling of deep spirituality. These are most represented in his late, late string quartets, which if you have the courage to listen to, I highly recommend listening to it. Uh, Beethoven eventually dies in 1827 at the age of 57 um, from complications from drinking too much. You see, his father was an alcoholic, his grandmother was an alcoholic, so it ran in the family. And we now believe that Beethoven suffered from some sort of bone disease. It was an overgrowth of bone, which caused his hearing loss as well. The bone grew to squash, essentially, squash the hearing nerves. Um, and that would explain why he had all these gastrointestinal problems and joint problems. So to try to, you know, try to make himself feel better from all this constant pain, he drank himself to death in a way. And he died from inflation of the liver. So, a very sad life. Actually, today a student asked me, why do composers die so sadly all the time? Um, it's not clear why musicians have such tragic lives. But then, of course, history is full of joys and tragedies. And so I think it's important to shed light onto the tragic side of it as well. Beethoven, of course, fought with his inner demons by working. He was incredibly prolific. And in addition to the string quartets and Fidelio that I've mentioned, we are truly blessed as pianists to have the 32 piano sonatas. These were of course written for him to practice writing symphonies, which was his greatest wishes. Because symphonies are basically sonatas for orchestra. And also sonatas were a great way for him to keep those aristocrats around. He writes a sonata, gives it to the aristocrat, the aristocrat feels good about it. And this is a way to keep his friends around and his lovers around, which were also, by the way, all aristocrats, which was also why he couldn't marry. Because back in those days, a commoner such as Beethoven couldn't marry an aristocrat. Um, Beethoven's Nine Symphonies, of course, you can't ignore about that. Very important works highly influential over many people. And um, the 32 sonatas span over early to late. So we, we pianists really are blessed to hear the differences in style. So with my talking generally finished about Beethoven, let's hear some examples of Beethoven. Can we, is it okay if we start with Fair Lisa? Okay. Yeah? Great. Would you guys gonna play for us a very well-known piece called Fair Lisa. Now, was I have a question for you? Yeah. Was Fair Lisa a well-known piece in Beethoven's lifetime? Well, actually, I was learning this for my RCM exam in the piece, and it said in there that like he wrote this piece because he had one of the students named Elise, and he was trying to make Elise his girlfriend, but it was not working, so he wrote a very difficult piece for her to play. Aha, uh -huh. yes. That's definitely the story that comes with it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Did you know that this piece was not uh, discovered until much after his death? It was published for the first time in 1850. 
some 30 years after his death. Um, and it's ironic that, of course, it's the most celebrated piece by Beethoven for general public as a result. Um, it's not very clear why, but, but here it is. So. style from last class. Last class I played an example of Haydn's sonata in C major, which I believe was written in the 1780s. So on and so forth. Where everything is very lighthearted and happy. And then here it is, just writing for some girl that he's teaching. Rather serious, no? But I think this is a very good mixture of that transitional period between romantic and classical. So you have this very romantic notion and then there are certain glimpses of the, the gallant style. 
rather rather high strong. Beautiful, thank you. I think this was written in 18 teens, which would have meant that it was 1810. 1810, am I right? Yeah, 1810, that would make him 40 years old, quite deaf, I think, um, but not completely. I, if I remember correctly, he performed until 1814. Um, although by that point, he was only accompanying people. He wasn't playing solo performances anymore as he couldn't hear enough to feel good about his own playing. Um, beautiful, thank you very much. Now let's uh, invite Myra to play for us the first movement of the, what we call Pathetic Sonata. Could you tell us a little bit about when this was written? Um, I'm pretty sure it was written in 1800, mm -hmm. in the year 1800. Um, so that yeah, puts so this in a early, middle, or late period. I would say it's like the transition from early to middle period for him. Yes. Um, the dates are, of course, proximate. You know, nobody wakes up one day and goes, aha, I'm going to write a different style from now on. It's all gradually done. This is one of the first sonatas of the 32 where Beethoven is really exploring having a character to a piece. That's why it has the nickname Pathetic, which was published together at the time. By the way, that also brings us to another sonata. Sorry, I'm diverging here. Um, there's a piece called the Moonlight Sonata by him. That's right. I played that too. Oh yes, yes, it's another, another favorite of the public. Um, did Beethoven call that it the Moonlight? He did not. He just called it a sonata in the style of a fantasy. But you see, the public, the publishers like to do things to make more money. So one of the things that they did was put a nickname to it called The Moonlight. This was rather popular because the romanticism in literature had begun already. Let's not forget that. By 1760, the, the world of literature had already enjoyed the birds of, for example, the sorrows of young Berta by, by Goethe. Right? So romanticism in spirit was already blooming. And this is another thing too that I wanna mention in general, is that it's always music that comes the latest, always. It seems to me, I think it was a, a professor of mine at Juilliard that says, it's always fine arts first, then the literature, then music. Music takes longer time to catch up to style. I wonder if it's because music is perhaps the most abstract version of the arts. You know, paintings you can see, literature you can read, but music, what is that exactly? Some weird language-like sounds, so I wonder. Okay, 
failed to mention that there's also the element that overall that social unrest is also reflected in most of this music as well, right? If the whole, it seems to be the case often in music history that if something, something is happening in world, world event, that's usually reflected in the music as well. And Beethoven himself really considered himself to be a revolutionary. He sympathized with, with those who, who rebelled against the aristocrats, which is hilarious because, of course, he was living off of the aristocrats at the same time. That makes him you know, quite a hypocrite. But, um, for example, I remember, I think it was John Elliott Gardner, a very well-established conductor, who mentioned that the first four notes of the Fifth Symphony, which I demonstrated earlier, uh, is reminiscent of a very well-known French revolutionary tune that the revolutionaries were singing as they were storming the streets. Um, whether that's true or not, um, perhaps more research is necessary, but it's highly possible that Beethoven was very much taken by this. Um, he is known to have complained about the aristocrats for the rest of his life, although of course he never betrayed them. He had the opportunity, to, for example, to become the court composer of Napoleon's younger brother, but he refused that. He'd rather stay with his old folks. Um, wonderful, thank you very much for the performances. Really, a pleasure. Um, now, I'd like to switch gears here and talk about another composer. I don't have very much time, so I'll make this very brief. Uh, and his name is Schubert, Franz Schubert. Is everybody familiar with Franz Schubert here? Franz Schubert was an Austrian composer that lived between 1797 and 1828. He is most celebrated for 600 songs for voice and piano. Um, my great colleague here at the Linda Blatt School of Music named Dr. Wayne, who is an old friend of mine from Yale days, we had uh, dinner and we were talking about how he would have, he would write a song and then have lunch and then come back and write another song. Um, as the dates show, he died at the age of 31, but he's, before he did, he finished a staggering number of works, I think something like 970 pieces. Um, he was a great admirer of Beethoven. In fact, he carried, he was one of the, one of the, one of those who carried Beethoven's coffin, um, as, as the funeral was laid, of course, only to find out that a year later he himself would be buried right next to him. Um, Schubert is 27 years younger than Beethoven, and had he continued to live and not die so young, would have lived well into the Romantic era. So that reflects that this is the rising of a new generation, the generation of what we call Romantics. But because Schubert never saw the days of the Romantics, he stayed most for the most part with the standard aesthetics of the classicism. But the spirit of the composer is very different from Beethoven. You see, Beethoven had to find his voice rising out of Mozart and Haydn. But Schubert found himself very comfortable expressing his feelings, uh, speaking of his inner feelings into his music from early on probably also because he wrote so many songs which often tell a story. Um, he was most prolific at the end of his life, I would say probably about the last two years. Um, and some of the great achievements he made during this time are the compositions of the late sonatas, uh, which combined together create something like three hours worth of music all written over a period of about seven months. Uh, he also wrote eight impromptus during this time, which also all together come to about two and a half hours worth of music. But it's not just the length that, that really makes an impact, it's the storytelling. And for the reasons that I can't really disclose, I'm not gonna tell you what he died from, but he knew from as early as age 25 that he was gonna die soon. And so there is the, the lamentation, the, the singing, the swan song, let's say, of how his life is gonna be cut short very soon. And 
this can be really felt in these pieces. So I'm going to attempt, I've never performed this, nor have I practiced it very much, but I'm going to attempt playing parts, at least parts of the very last piano sonata that you wrote, uh, Sonata in B flat major. And I think you will see what I mean. We had somebody, by the way, prepared to play a Schubert piece, an impromptu, but she could not be here today. So you'll have to make do with my, my reading. Somebody, my page turning, do you mind? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 
just heard was the exposition and development of the sonata. So you can see the structure is much larger. The storytelling is much more spread out. It's much more emotional and deep. It definitely is incredibly tragic. I mean, a, a student of mine asked if a major key could be tragic. And certainly this is the case where major key could be utterly tragic. Um, so I hope you will have in your own interest and curiosity exploration of Schubert as well. Great composer that died too young. Thank you very much.